Hello and thanks for coming back to part two of the Dionysian Artificers and we'll pick up where we left off. Now if you rectify your globe to the latitude of Jerusalem 3130 at that period of the year you will have the sun in Aries or the sun represented by a ram or sheep or a man in a sheep's skin as the Hierophant was represented in the mysteries of Eleusis. Therefore, the very period of the year in which the foundation stone of the temple was laid would afford an opportunity of establishing upon it a new allegorical system to explain the ancient mystery. If we suppose the globe to represent the world in the position above described, the aspirant being the, in the west facing the Hierophant, who in the east represents the rising sun, the candidate will find himself between the two tropics represented by the two columns, which were placed on the west entrance of that temple. The better to understand the facility with which the ancient system could be adapted to the circumstances of the temple of Jerusalem, we must consider its typical uh, emblems. Uh, according to the notions of Jews and some of the Christian fathers. The temples built in honor of the several gods were so shaped as to have allusion to the supposed attributes of such gods, but the universe was supposed by the Platonists to be the true temple of the true and only God. The temple therefore dedicated to the true God was to be a type of the universe. Thus, we find that the Temple of Jerusalem was situated east and west, and with dimensions and types all adapted to represent the universal system of nature. If the Temple of Solomon was a type of the universe to symbolize that Jehovah was no local god but the only god, Lord of the universe, tradition also tells us that the place of assembly of the Dionysian artificers was allegorically described by its dimensions as a symbol of the universe, in length, in breadth, in height, and in depth. The ancients represented the course of the stars by the winding of a snake, but if this snake was so placed as to have the tail in her mouth, it then represented eternity. That would be the oral boros. Now, if we consider the beginning of the civil year amongst the Hebrews, the month of Tisri, which was in the winter equinox, the sun proceeding from thence approaches the south and touches the Tropic of Capricorn, then retrocedes towards the north, crossing the equinoxal and touching the Tropic of Cancer, from whence retroceding again to the south arrives at the equinoxial finishing of the year. These points in an extended map of the two hemispheres seem separate, but the emblem of the snake biting its tail would represent the end of the year meeting the beginning. Mr. Hutchinson has proved that the globes on top of the two columns at the portico of the temple were ovaries, or mechanical representations of the motions of the heavenly bodies. I think that after those circumstances which afforded so many facilities for the introduction of the system of the Dionysian artificers in Judea, the continuance of the same in subsequent periods cannot be of difficult explanation. We find it stated in the book of Maccabees that a society existed in those days in Judea called the Assidians or the Cassidians those whose business it was to take care of the repairs of the temple. From these Cassidians proceeded the sect or society of the Essenians, or the Essenes, or maybe of the Essenes and Essenians, which according to Philo and Joseph, Josephus were the same as the Essenians, and are probably because they admitted no women in their assemblies, uh, Pliny says that they were propagated without wives. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's. Josephus mentions the first of the Essenians, and in the time of Aristobulus and Antigonus, or Antigonus, the son of Hyrcanus, but Suidas 
and the others were of opinion that they were a branch of Rechabites who subsided or subsisted before the captivity. Josephus, probably ignorant of the secret tenets of the Essenians, also accuses them of worshipping the sun or saying prayers before the sun rising, as if to incite him to rise. But this very accusation again identifies them with the sect of the Dionysian artificers, who, as appears by reason above stated, were supposed to adore the sun. Josephus relates many other particulars by which, in a striking manner, he brings them to what we have related of other societies which preceded them. It also points out that the conformity of their ideas with those of the Platonists and the Dionysians on the nature of the soul, in short, they use symbols, allegories, and parables after the manner of the ancients. The practices of those Essenians are represented by Philo as the most pacific or pacified and full of social virtues. And among them, who were the most enthusiastic for their tenets, had their goods in common as the Christians had in the first ages of Christianity. The Essenians had not their ceremonies and mysteries recorded in history, but thus far we know that they transmitted to posterity the doctrines which they received from their ancestors. They had also distinguishing signs, and the festival banquets, though it does not appear that they followed the profession of builders or architects exclusively. Out of Judea we also find societies distinguished by the same characters as the Essenians with the same tenets of Plato, for the Pythagoreans also employed the symbols of the art of building. The Dionysian artificers existed also in Syria, Persia, and India, and the Eleusinian mysteries were preserved in Europe even at Rome until the 8th century of the Christian era. After this epoch, Europe was visited by the most barbarous nations who, persecuting every scientific research, scattered a general darkness in which all the labors of the ancients in favor of mankind were nearly lost in the general ignorance of their time. Those very societies and sects had also been in former periods much abused and the ceremonies converted, as we have seen, for the worst of purposes. This was another powerful cause for their decline and ruin. Christianity was then in Europe, and only bond, the only bond of morality by which power could, in some measure, be controlled or restrained. When the sciences began to revive, a general fanaticism prevailed, and a spirit of persecution appeared, which caused the ancient doctrines of philosophers and of the old systems of morality to be regarded only as offsprings of atheism and practices of idolatry. Under these circumstances, the Eleusinians and the Dionysian artificers, Assidians or Essenians, sunk into such oblivion that no mention is made of them in history. In the 10th century, during the wars of the Crusades, some of the societies were instituted in Palestine and Europe, which adopted some regulations resembling those of ancient fraternities, but is what it was in England, and chiefly in Scotland, where the remains of the old system, identified with that of the Dionysian artificers, were discovered in modern times. Katera de uh, footnotes, a number of authorities prove that these are collected in Kirker, Volume 1, uh, page 288. Agaigia uh, uh, mi bakum kanit, Osiris Egyptus Patat, Arabia, Arabi, and Jens Andonium, and Asonius in a mile barbum, sorry, and, uh, so, Mercius had collected all the authorities and fragments found in ancient authors upon the Eleusinian ceremonies. Uh, Plutarchus, uh, De Aside et Osiride, uh, Richard, Sir. These are all the uh, uh, references. You see the numbers as I was reading above that was next to some of the uh, comments. I, I imagine this is what it's referring to. That way you can 
So Plutarchus in Vitae Numai says that to offer an odd number to the celestial gods and an even one to the terrestrial is proper, the sense of which precept is hidden from the vulgar. Uh, quote. So the same Plutarchus in Vitae Lacerti, explaining the number of the Spartan senators, who were 28, says, quote, something perhaps there is being a perfect number formed of seven, multiplied by four, and withal the first number after six that is equal to all of its parts, end quote. Another proof of the mystic import of numbers is found in Plutarchus in Vitae Fabi, and the, another quote, the perfection of the number three consists in being the first of odd numbers and the first of plurals, the containing in itself the first differences and the first elements of all numbers, end quote. The fertility caused by the inundations of the Nile over the adjacent country caused this river to be considered as a mystic representation of the sun, parent of all fecundity of the earth, and therefore the name was given to it containing the number 365, or three or days in the solar year. The Greeks thus perversed or preserved the name. And uh, you see here they have Greek... Uh, writing mixed with numbers um, and then we have Potter's Grace, uh, Dionysius Echobolus, uh that the Athenians invented the Eleusinian mysteries but in the first book of his library he says that they were brought from Egypt by Erechtheus uh, Theoret Lib Grex effect says that it was Orpheus who invented those mysteries in imitating, however, the Egyptian festivities of Isis. And Arnobius and Lactanius describe those mysteries also, uh, does Clements. Um, let's see, they were extorted to direct their passions to merit promotion by improving their minds. More footnotes, more footnotes um, of the Greek kind would do me no good to read to you. So anyway, the footnote 10 7 says, Mary of Abia, Saturnalia. Uh, and it says, I will copy here an English translation of this passage, the Marabia Saturnalia, from the library, whatever numbers those are of the book, <clears throat> which I have read somewhere, he says. So this is the uh, supposed to be the English translation of that. He says, He who desires in palm of sacred dress the sun's resplendent body to express should first a veil assume a purple bright like fair white beams combined with fiery light. On his right shoulder next a mule's broad hide widely diverse with spotted pride should hang an image of the pole divine and dull stars whose orbs eternal shine. A golden splendid zone then o'er his vest, the next should throw and bind it round his breast. In mighty token how with golden light the rising sun from earth's last bounds and night sudden emerges and with matchless force darts through old ocean's billows in its course, his course. A boundless splendor, hence enshrined in dew, plays on his whirlpools, glorious to the view, while his circumfluent waters spread abroad, full in the presence of the radiant God. But oceans circle like a zone of light, the sun's wide bosom girds and charms the wandering sight. In, in the passage. Some more footnotes with some Greek uh, references, uh, fragments. Dissertation on the caravans taken from Colonel Campbell's, Campbell's Travels in India. Now, so, uh, perfected part precedes initiation, and initiation precedes inspection. Again, philosophy may be called in the initiation into the sacred ceremonies, and the tradition of genuine mysteries are there, uh, for there are five parts of initiation. The first is previous purgation 
uh, for neither are the mysteries communicated to all who are willing to receive them but there are certain characters who are prevented by the voice of the crier such as those who possess impure hands and inarticulate voice since it is necessary that such as are not expelled from the mystery should first be refined by certain purgations but after purgation the tradition of the sacred rite succeeds the third part is denominated inspection and the fourth which is the end of fixing of the crowns so that the initiated may by these means be enabled to communicate to others the sacred rites in which he has been instructed whether after this he become a torchbearer or an interpreter of the mysteries or sustain some other part of the sacerdotal office the but in fifth which is produced from all of these is friendship with divinity the enjoyment of that felicity which arises from intimate converse with the gods so the theo of smyrna in uh, mathemat, mathemat, uh, i approach the confines of death and treading on the threshold of prosperpine or prosperpine uh prosperpine uh, however you want to pronounce it, and carried through all the elements, I came back again to my pristine situation. In the depth of midnight, I saw the sun glittering with a splendid light together with the infernal and supernatural gods, and approaching nearer to those divinities, I paid the tribute of devout adoration. End quote. Uh, Apuleius Metamorph lived three and uh, this month after according to the julian year answers to november or the winter solstice but with the jews the month of tammuz uh, when the sol solemnities of adonis were celebrated in judea was in june or the summer solstice the reason appears to be that the jews taking this month from the vague year of the egyptians and not from the fixed year settled tammuz in the summer solstice uh, some more footnote, just reference the darkest books. Uh, we must here observe that the fables were intended to convey more than one meaning in proof of which we copy the following passage. And so this quote of this passage of fables, some are theological, others animastical, or relating to the soul, others material. And lastly, others mixed of all these. Fables are theological, which employ nothing corporeal and both speculate the very essence of the gods such as the fable which asserts that saturn devoured his children for it insinuates nothing more than the nature of an intellectual god since every intellect returns to itself but we speculate fables physically when we speak concerning the energies of the gods about the world as when considering saturn at the same as time chronos the calling of the parts of time, the children of the universe, we assert that the children are devoured by their parent, but we employ fables in an animastic mode when we contemplate the energies of the soul because the intellection of our souls, though by discursive energy, they run into other things, yet abiding their parents. Lastly, fables are material, such as the Egyptians ignorantly employ, considering the calling corporeal nature's divinities, such as Isis, Earth, Osiris, humidity, Typhon, heat, or again, denominating Saturn, water, Adonis, fruits, and Bacchus, wine, and indeed to assert that these are dedicated to the gods in the same manner as herbs, stones, and animals is a part of a wise man, or wise men. But to call them gods is alone the province of fools and madmen, unless we speak in the same manner as when from established the custom we call the orb of the sun and its rays the sun itself. But we may perceive the mixed kind of fables as well as in many other particulars as when they relate that discord at the banquet of the gods through the golden apple and that a dispute about it arising amongst the goddesses they were sent by jupiter to take of the judgment of paris who charmed with the beauty of venus gave her the apple in preference to the rest for in this fable the banquet denotes the supermundane 
powers of the gods, and on this account a subsisting conjunction with each other, but the golden apple denotes the world, which, on account of its composition from the contrary natures, is not improperly said to be thrown by discord or strife. But again, since different gifts are imparted to the world by different gods, they appear to contest with each other for the apple. The living soul and a living and a soul living according to sense, for this is Paris, and not perceiving other powers in the universe, asserts that the apple is alone the beauty of Venus. Of these species of fables, such as are theological, belong to philosophers, in the fi the physical and animastical to poets, but they were mixed with initiatory rites and the intention of all mystic ceremonies is to conjoin us with the world and the gods. So there was you know, the Platonic uh, philosopher. So we got some more Ophius hymn, soul, and Adon, more reference to more books. The Egyptians began reckoning their months from the time when the sun enters now in the beginning of the sign Aries. Uh, why has he, Aratus, taken the commencement of the year from Cancer, when the Egyptians date the beginning from Aries. Theon 69, Herodotus says that the statue of Jupiter Ammon at the head of a ram, as Sibius uh, Paraphat tells us that the idol Ammon had a ram's head with the goats, or horns of the goats. They're very similar to the Baphomet. Um, or in in some other religions, it would be like Pan, the nature god, or many other goat-headed gods depicted. Um, informs us, okay, so Strabo informs us that in time the Egyptians nowhere sacrificed sheep, but in the Neotic Nome. And now also Pindar speaking of the Illusionian mysteries deducts this inference, blessed is he who, and I quote this, Blessed is he who, having seen the common things under the earth, also knows what is the end of life, for he knows the empire of Jupiter. End quote. Clemens Strom, from uh, another quote, Since in fable he venerates with a becoming silence the assertion delivered in the arcane discourses that men are placed in the body as in a certain prison secured by a guard and testifies according to the mystic ceremonies the different allotments of pure and impure souls in Hades, their habits and the triple path and the rising of their essences and thus according to paternal and sacred institutions, all which are full of symbolical theory and of the poetical descriptions concerning the ascent and descent of the souls and the Dionysial signs, the punishment of the Titans, and the trivia and the wanderings in Hades and everything of the same kind. End quote. And I actually wanted to make a comment in the first half of the, when, part one when they was telling you right at the very beginning of all the different fables that talked about how your soul uh, is mired in mud or, or made of, you know, put in clay, is formed in clay by some reference uh, metaphorically. Um, you know, biblically, dust of the earth, whatever. And all of them implicate that the soul is, like here, placed in the body as it's, uh, as the body being the physical prison or the cell, the cells of the body. There's, we could go on with that, but that's another subject. Um, point being, it's all false, people. Your soul is not in your body. You have spirit in your body, but as far as your body goes, it's just an interface. Your brain is just, it's just like a dashboard, it's how you interact with this material world. Uh, your essence or your consciousness uh, through this uh, perceptive tool, because that's all the body is, is a tool. Uh, reminds me of a musical group, a very good one in fact. So I will carry on. Uh, we live their death and then we die their life. Macarius himself, the ancient theologist, also testify that the soul is in the body, as it were, in a sepulchre, to suffer punishment. See? So all these, this is this 
theology doesn't come, you know, just from like Christian ideas. And this is long before, and it has a long history. And it's all the same stuff. Uh, which again, when you reach uh, a certain uh, level of enlightenment, if you practiced uh, Kundalini, if you've tried meditating, if you've tried to attain the higher states, and even if you cheated doing so, whether it was using drugs like DMT or hallucinogenics, other drugs, I mean, I'll admit that's how I know is, is I cheated. Um, and um, when you do those things, you see that uh, that's actually why they're illegal. They don't want you to do them because they'll open your eyes to. Uh, <laughs> to this prison that you're really in. Um, so, okay, and when the soul has descended into the generation, she participates of evil and profoundly rushes into the region of dismaltitude and to be entirely merged in nothing more than into dark mire. Again, the soul therefore dies through vice as much as it is possible for the soul to die. And the soul, or death of the soul, is while merged or baptized, as it were, in the present body to descend into matter and be filled with its impurity after departing from this body to lie absorbed in its filth until it returns to a superior condition and elevates its eye from the overwhelming mire for he plunged in matter is to descend into Hades and there to fall asleep. Okay. And I hope you caught all that metaphor. You can I'll pull it back a minute. Okay. Because it's what it's talking about here. It's, it's, it's all a frequency range. Okay. And of course we know energy doesn't die. The soul doesn't die. Um, it, again, the soul is not in your body. It doesn't die. Uh, energy is transformed, uh, but it's never dissipated. Um, it can change, but it can't die. And um, so then while merged or baptized, it's talking here about your descent into matter, which is again the... Uh, Fibonacci scale, basically. Uh, kind of, I mean, it's compared to that. That's also been used too, because it's a good comparison, because that's what you're talking about is frequency levels. And so to be plunged down the spectrum into the lower frequencies of the material world. And uh, by vice, you know, that's why, where the whole idea of uh, giving up all your vices and all this and purifying yourself so you can rise, this is where all this comes from. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's Plutonius in the Aeneid. And uh, he who is not able, uh, this is Romans, I guess, he who is not able by the exercise of his reason to define the idea of the good, separating it from all other objects and piercing, as in a battle, through every kind of argument, endeavoring to confute, not according to opinion, but according to essence, and proceeding through all these dialectical energies with the unshaken reason. For he who cannot accomplish this, would you not say that he neither knows the good itself, nor anything which is properly denominated good? And would you not assert that such a one, when he apprehends any certain image of reality, apprehends it rather through the medium of opinion than of science, that in the present life he is sunk in sleep, and conversant with delusions of dreams, and that before he is roused to a vigilant state, he will descend to Hades and be overwhelmed with sleep perfectly profound. Plato directed them. The Egyptians called matter, which they symbolically denominated water, the dregs or sediment of the first life, matter being, as it were, a certain mire or mud. Lastly, okay, the Simplicius and Aristotle, uh, Fis, whatever those, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I wish they'd spell out the whole books, but you're supposed to know this stuff. 
So lastly, that I may comprehend the opinion of the ancient theologists on the state of the soul after death, in a few words they considered, as we have elsewhere asserted, things divine as the only realities, and that all others were only the images or shadows of truth. Hence they asserted that prudent men who earnestly employed themselves in divine concerns were above all others in a vigilant state, but that imprudent men who pursued objects of a different nature, being laid asleep, as it were, were only engaged in the delusions of a dream, and that if they happened to die in this sleep before they were roused, they would be afflicted with similar and still sharper visions in a future state. In other words, if you don't wake up, and that's what Jesus was actually talk, talking and teaching when he came, uh, the Christians, they put a big emphasis on the death of Jesus. Uh, I'm Gnostic, and I put a big emphasis on the life of Jesus and his actual teachings, because he was here trying to teach you something. Uh, how to drag yourself out of that mire is what he was teaching you. And uh, that we're talking about here, and this is this is sleepness, this awareness um, that comes when you're granted with that spirit and the, the eyes to see and the ears to hear and all this and that, as it were. Um, this is the goal of every every religion, every mystic practice, every mystery uh, that is ever laid out by any god under any name. Okay, and uh, this is the difference. There's you can see in this example right here. Uh, this right here, uh, fin Ficinius de Immortalit Animen, something like that. You know, I'm not very good at Latin, but. Uh, uh, they're only engaged in the delusions of the dream. Now, what are we all out here talking about? We're out here divided because we have people that are in a delusional state, in a dreamlike state. They're they're walking around. They're sleepwalking. They're we call them zombies. We call them sheep. Or we, we we've used every book in the word. I'm guilty of it. I know because they irritate the crap out of me. So I call them all kinds of names. It ain't no big deal. I mean, I don't take it personal. You know what I'm saying? So. This is exactly what this is talking about. And you have the men that will achieve, that will aspire to be greater. Uh, like me, my whole life, since I was young, I aspired for spiritual things, for knowledge, for uh, searching for God, for instance, or for whatever. In that realm, I was never impressed with material things, and I never uh, uh, pursued uh, material success or worldly um, success or goals. Um, and then you have the people that uh, it's all they care about is you know their next nice car or, uh, mowing their lawn or, or am I going to buy a boat next year or go to the Bahamas or uh, what's on fucking TV tonight <laughs> that you know and, and they're, they're asleep so this is what this is actually referring to in this section you know and what the whole thing is all about uh, this whole journey that's another thing it's not a destination okay it's a journey. This is a journey. If you have life eternal, your your soul, your essence is eternal, uh, your energy is eternal. Um, then you, why are you gonna end? If you if you're looking for a destination, then you're gonna find one, and that's where you're gonna be stuck. It's right there in that destination that you you were looking for. Uh, all kinds of people are, are right there right now. So. In that dream, delusions of the dream, and that if they happen to die in this sleep before they were roused, they would be afflicted with similar and still sharper visions in a future state. In other words, they leave. If you leave this state of being in a uh, lower frequency uh, state of being, then the next place you go is going to be along that frequency line. If you arouse yourself into awakening here, and you lift yourself up in the higher frequencies of this state so then when you leave this state in death you will move on to a higher state in the next construct whatever it may be so he who was conversant with all fallacies would hereafter be tormented with the fallacies and delusions in the extreme as the one would be delighted with the true objects of enjoyment see so I mean if you're leaving and, and this kind of you can see this as evidence, you know, they, they talk about hauntings and stuff, and you can see the leftover energy signatures that are left at uh, areas of the world that have been traumatic. 
uh, whether they were uh, scenes of a you know a civil war battle or a, a mental hospital where a lot of people were wrongfully uh, treated or whatever and then so there's that energy that's left over um, as these people pass on to because they're in a wrong state of being when they pass and they pass on to that level of frequency so objects of enjoyment it's what you want to hang on to, you know, even if it's little things. And so the other will be tormented with delusive semblances of reality. And so right here, this is the most truthful statement that we've came across so far. And we are on 21. Um, there's 37 pages in this. I'm going to call this part two. And I'll make a part three soon. And uh, we'll carry on forward from here. Thanks for joining me.